Welcome to Moral Politics. I'm your host, Bill Wolford. Is Social Security broke? Radio and TV reports paint that grim picture. None other than George W. Bush made that point on C-SPAN. It's so confusing because other reports state that Social Security has been cash positive since its start in 1935. Guest Robbie Stern, president of Puget Sound Alliance of Retired Americans, will set the record straight. It is my pleasure to welcome Robbie Stern to Moral Politics. Thank you for having me. Well, right off the bat, let me just put the question to you. Is Social Security broke? No. No, and in fact, no one is arguing that it's broke. The Congressional Budget Office says there's enough in the Social Security Trust Fund to pay benefits through 2039, and the trustees for the Social Security Trust Fund says there's enough to pay benefits through 2037. So we know that there is a $2.5, uh, $2.6 trillion surplus in the Social Security Trust Fund, uh, and there's no one who's claiming that it's broke now. What they're saying is uh, that it won't be able to pay full benefits after 2037 or 2039. Uh, and so they want to talk about trying to do something now to deal with that. Is it fair to say that Social Security has its enemies? Oh, goodness, yes. I mean, Social Security has its, had its enemies since it was first created in 1935, and those enemies continue to this day. There are many people uh, who are mostly, frankly, on the Republican side, who don't want to see the government play the role of pro having programs that provide for people's needs. Social Security is known as the third rail in politics. Do you think that's not true anymore? Well, I'm afraid it's not, and, that's, and that, that is very distressing. Um, it, it would appear now that uh, there is a reasonable chance that we're going to have a big fight and a, at least a very robust debate about Social Security and what is going to happen with Social Security. Well, if you hear from the Democrats, you hear that Social Security has never contributed one penny to the national debt. Well, that's correct. I mean, what, how Social Security is funded, it's funded through a separate uh, funding mechanism called FICA, and all of us pay into it, employers and uh, workers, we all pay into it, and that money goes into a separate fund uh, a dedicated fund that's there to pay Social Security benefits when people are eligible for it. So it has not contributed one penny to the debt that we see today. One, one magazine, a prestigious magazine, the American Prospect, said that over the next 75 years, it's all very fixable. It, you know, the worst case scenario is, is it would, would, would do what I've got it here. It would be seven-tenths of one percent of GDP even. So this just underscores the high-strung rhetoric. Right. I mean, uh, we are seeing high-strung rhetoric. We're not just seeing it around Social Security. We're seeing it in a whole variety of areas. But if we are worried about Social Security's ability to pay full benefits, 100 percent of benefits, uh, after 2037, all we need to do is get rid of the cap on income for Social Security. Right now, uh, people who earn over $106,800 pay not one penny of Social Security premium on everything they earn above $106,800. There is no cap on Medicare. Mm -hmm. We eliminate that cap and Social Security can pay de benefits and be improved f uh, over the next 100 years. So even though the baby boomers represent this bunny or this rabbit in the boa constrictor, you're still confident that it's not going to bust the national budget. Well, in 1983, they were planning for the baby boomers who were going to reach retirement age. At that time, they raised the Social Security premium that employers and workers paid, and they also increased the retirement age. Uh, they staged it in up to age 67. So now we have $2.6 trillion in surplus in the Social Security Trust Fund. It's going to go up beyond that to around 6 or $7 trillion. Uh, over the course of the next seven or eight years. And then as the Social Security, as the baby boomers start retiring, they're going to begin to use that surplus. And Social Security is not broke. No, no, it's not broke. And I, I don't know how many of us would like to be in the position where we could say, hey, we know we can look out and see we're going to be just great 
until 2037. And then after that, we can make a minor adjustment, what would be only fair, because there's no good reason why people who earn over $106,800 shouldn't have to pay part of uh, what they earn into the Social Security Trust Fund, since they're going to be receiving Social Security benefits. Isn't there a little bit of a shell game where Social Security is mixed with Medicare and Medicaid? So all the numbers and all the impact on the federal budget and the deficit are a little bit confused. Well, the funding mechanism for Medicare and Medicaid is very different from Social Security. So, as I said before, Social Security has a separate stream of revenue that goes into the Social Security Trust Fund. Medicare and Medicaid, the, the taxes that are paid on Medicare, they go into the general fund. And Medicaid is paid partially out of the general fund, the federal general fund, and partly out of the state's general budgets. And um, so those are separate, separate mechanisms. Not that we shouldn't be fighting for good programs there as well, Medicare and Medicaid, but I think there's a genuine issue of health care costs that we have to deal with in terms of the deficit that we're facing now. And uh, we're, we're working on that. But it's a separate issue from Social Security, which has a dedicated funding stream and a dedicated trust fund. Now, I want you to explain that a little bit for me. I know it confused me when I first really stumbled on this idea of the Social Security Trust Fund. How does the funding of Social Security really work? Well, what happens is all of us who work for a living, uh, and I worked in, you know, for a living until I retired, uh, we pay 6.5% uh, of our income into the Social Security Trust Fund, and employers match what we pay. And that goes into the Social Security Trust Fund. What happens? What exactly is that? Well, the, what, what has happened is that uh, that money has been borrowed uh, by, the, by the Congress, by the federal government, and they've issued treasury certificates, which is supposed to be as good as cash. Mm -hmm. The treasury certificates, uh, they issue those certificates, and then those certificates come due over a period of time. You can buy them for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, however long they are, the life of the treasury certificate and they pay interest. So what has happened is that the federal government, uh, the Congress, has borrowed money from the Social Security Trust Fund to fund a number of different programs. And given these huge tax cuts to the very wealthy in our society, the Bush tax cuts. So we're funding two wars and the Bush tax cuts. And if they want to deal with the deficit, those are the first two things they need to deal with. The Social Security Trust Fund is like a cookie jar. Right. The children work really hard mowing lawns, putting in $10 bills over a long period of time. And of course, in the case of the Social Security Fund, with it reaching $2.6 trillion, you can understand why the, the government would be tempted. In this case, we use this analogy of the parents being tempted to borrow from that cookie jar. As long as it's borrowing, now if the parent goes to the cookie jar and takes out the money and doesn't pay it back, that's not a good analogy. Well, especially if the parent is living beyond its means and right. living off plastic. If the parent is borrowing the money and is paying it back to the kid, uh, then that's a legitimate comparison. Uh, and if the parent issues particularly paper, that is treasury certificates, that says, I am, by taking this money, making an obligation to pay you back plus this amount of interest, now you've got yourself a really good analogy. Well, now, now we come to the crux of the problem. We have IOUs the government has to pay back, but it doesn't want to. And so it now has the, the attackers on the attack to basically put Social Security on the table for entitlement cuts. Number one, I think that it is incorrect to refer to Social Security as an entitlement. It's like an insurance policy. When you pay your premiums for your auto insurance or you pay it for your homeowner's insurance, um, you pay those premiums and then if something happens, there's an obligation to pay the cost or some proportion of the cost of, uh, of the loss that you experience. That's what the Social Security Trust Fund is like. So it's not an entitlement, it's something that people have paid for and are now collecting back. It is true that historic enemies of Social Security are now trying to use the deficit as an excuse to go after the Social Security system and against Social Security payments. Now, they would never say that. Mm -hmm. They will instead say, well, we have to deal with this because it's part of the deficit problem. 
but it's incorrect. That's an incorrect characterization. Social Security has not contributed one penny to the deficit. What Social Security has done is it's provided a source of money for them to utilize because of the deficit that they created by the Bush era tax cuts in these two wars. Well, the people who don't really depend on Social Security seem to be rather adamant about cutting it because they can avoid taxes. I think that you have some of the ideological um, enemies of Social Security who are adamant about raising the retirement age, about a means testing Social Security. Uh, I think you have some of the enemies of Social Security who are putting that out there. For example, the Deficit Commission was chaired by uh, uh, one of the people who chaired that Deficit Commission that was appointed by President Obama was Alan Simpson, who's hated Social Security for years. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you are finding them using any excuse they can to attack Social Security. But again, this goes back to the point that he doesn't depend on Social Security. That social contract with him probably isn't very strong. Well, probably that's right. But there are many people who are uh, in the same income category as Alan Simpson who are extremely supportive of Social Security and understand that it makes no sense to cut Social Security. I mean, let's remember that Social Security was created in 1935 because so many seniors, 75% of all seniors, were living in poverty. And it was expanded since then, so now it provides benefits to children who's lo who've lost a parent or people who are eligible for Social Security disability. These are people who would live in abject poverty if there was no Social Security. In my organization, Puget Sound Alliance for Retired Americans, we have particularly a number of older women who did not have jobs where there were unions and there were no pensions. And they are living solely on Social Security. Social Security is the only source of income for them. And if they didn't have Social Security, they would be on the streets. And there may be some people who know, hey, if I lose Social Security, I'm going to be just fine. But that's not the vast majority of the population in this country, whether they're on Social Security now or will be on Social Security in the future. Do you think that there's a need for a lockbox? No, I, I, I don't agree with that. I think that it doesn't make sense to take the money and just put it underneath a mattress and not have it collect interest. And if you're going to collect interest, then it's going to be out there, it's going to be in the market, and the money is going to be borrowed to do other things. As long as it's not just subsidizing t tax cuts for right, the rich. Right, right, absolutely. You know, th but that's an issue that we have to take up. It's a separate issue from Social Security. Uh, and certainly the Bush era tax cuts were implemented by people who were no friends of Social Security. In fact, they were also implemented by the same people who wanted to privatize Social Security. And the people in this country stood up and said, you will not privatize Social Security. Well, what about Goldman Sachs? Aren't they chomping at the bit? <clears throat> oh, the Goldman business? Sachs is chomping at the bit. They want to get their hands on Either they'd like to get their hands on some of the money from the Social Security Trust Fund, trying to get them to invest it in Wall Street, or uh, their preference is to have private accounts. Uh, but I, I think that people in this country are too smart for that. We all know that, number one, uh, defined benefit pensions, pensions where you know you're going to get a certain amount of money as a result of being uh, employed by a particular employer for a period of time, they're going away. Uh, now we have these 401ks that as a result of Wall Street's irresponsibility over the course of the last three or four years have become 101ks. And by people, that you mean they've just lost value? They've lost value and people were relying on those not only to remain there but to grow and instead they went the other way. That's, there's no reason to believe that Goldman Sachs would not show the same level of irresponsibility as they did with people's money in their 401ks. And, and, and you put this in the context of defined benefits going away as well, that you know, this is really kind of a dire story that you're saying. That what, what I'm saying is that people are going to be more and more reliant, working people, people who are earning you know, anywhere from uh, $18,000 a year to $90,000 a year. They're going to be reliant on Social Security when they no longer are able to work to be able to have a life of dignity and respect. And it's our responsibility, the Puget Sound Alliance for Retired Americans, to make sure that our kids and our grandkids have it there and it's there for them to deal with what we know is inevitable. Aging 
is relentless. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're all going to be facing it, and we're all going to be faced with the fact that we have to have an income to have a retirement of dignity and respect. You are basically bringing up the idea of a social contract. Is there a social contract? Well, to Social Security. Well, I, I think that it's the same kind of social contract that you have with an insurance company that you pay auto insurance to or an insurance company that you pay for your homeowner's insurance. Yes. There's a responsibility when you pay your premiums, when the time comes and you have a need, you've had a loss, then you are to be paid back. And there's a contract uh, uh, to do that. Now, I know that there was a Supreme Court decision. Yeah, I was going to interject, uh, Fleming versus Nestor. I know, I know, you, you know, and I know about that Supreme Court decision, but the reality is that the people of this country have the ability to demand that when we pay into this system all of our working lives, that it pay us back, and it pay us back in a reasonable way. Uh, maybe we'll learn a little bit from the people in Egypt. But it's not just seniors that benefit that's from this right. social contract. That's right. Uh, you know, for example, uh, at our 75th birthday party for Social Security, we had a woman come and tell her story of her husband dying when, she was in, when he was in his 40s. And she had two young sons. And were it not for Social Security, they would have lost their house, they would have lost everything. There's survivor benefits for Social Security, and there's also Social Security disability. Those are two really, really important programs that have helped millions and millions and millions of people in this country. I think that there are uh, about six or seven million kids in our country who are receiving Social Security benefits as a result of having a, a, a parent who died. It's not a generous amount, though, is it? All I do know is she said it made it possible for them to survive. Now, whether, and it allowed them to stay in their home, it allowed them to continue to live a life that was very comparable to what they were living before her husband died. Well, you know, there's some that put up the argument it's just not government's role to be insuring people for their uh, retirement. It's, it's an individual right, a responsibility. Well, I know. That's the argument of those who hate Social Security. We made the decision that it was just fine for the government to uh, be the insurer of people when they get into old age and that as long as people pay for it, which we do when we work, every single one of us, and what we, what we get in Social Security benefits is pegged to what we earn when, during our working lives, um, that it's just fine for the government to do it. We'd rather the government do it than have some private insurance company do it. The administrative cost for Social Security is less than 1%. You don't get that from any private insurance company, and you sure as heck don't get that from Wall Street. As long as, as, long as it operates on a pay-go basis, it's, it's administered very well, is what you're saying. Yeah, I mean, it's administered very well. And right now, it's not pay-go. It's not right now the situation where what you're paying in goes out. Right now, there's a sufficient surplus so that Social Security is earning interest, and the interest plus the income is paying for Social Security benefits and will pay for Social Security benefits until 2037. So actually what you're saying is that we're doing a lot better than pay-go. Oh, absolutely. And if, if they do nothing, if they don't scrap the cap, if they don't get rid of the $106,800 cap, then by 2037, then we're going to be on a situation where what goes in comes out. And they'll be paying benefits at about 76% of the level that, uh, uh, that would be 100%. But that 76% on the pay-go basis, on what goes in, comes out, would still be almost $1,000 a year more than what Social Security benefits are being paid now on average. Well, I know there was a commission or some study that uh, I think it's recommendations were implemented where the age is going to increase for retirement. Well, question. the age is now re increasing up to age 67. That's that, and it's, it's slowly increasing so that people who are now retiring, they have to be 66 years in some months. I'm not sure what it is. And it will go up to 67. And that was the 1983. You're saying that people that are starting out work today cannot retire before they're 66 and a half. Uh, uh, well, the people who are starting out at work today are, are going to uh, have as their retirement age 67. The people who are in their 55, 56, 57, they're going to be re able to get full benefits at some point uh, while they're 66. And that's 
that's going up. That's generally going up until it reaches age 67. We do need to talk about fixes to Social Security. It seems like there's always talk about uh, cutting some program to, to make sure it's on a, a sound footing. Right. What are the fixes to Social Security? Well, we've talked about it already. If you want to assure the life of Social Security for the next 100 years, just eliminate the cap. If you eliminate the $106,800 cap, Social Security will have enough premiums coming in to pay benefits with COLAs, with cost of living increases, for the next 100 years. And we could look at improving Social Security as well. There are some improvements that should be made and could be made. Mm -hmm. Number one, we ought to be paying low-income people working what would be considered now the working poor. We could be paying them a higher percentage of the income that they have earned in Social Security benefits. Two, we should change the COLA that's used. And in fact, Senator Cantwell has introduced a piece of legislation that would change the COLA or the cost of living uh, uh, index for Social Security to take into account what the actual costs are for seniors uh, when, you know, because seniors have higher medical expenses than the rest of the population, so we need to change the COLA. On. So we could make those improvements just by simply scrapping the cap. Didn't the Obama budget compromise entail a reduction of 6.2 to 4.2 percent? Well, that's not, that wasn't, that wasn't, yeah, that was not related to the cap. What the tax compromise that they worked in December did was it lowered for one year the amount that workers pay into the Social only Security, workers. only workers, what workers pay into the Social Security system by 2 percent to 4.5 percent. And they agreed that the $121 billion of revenue that was lost to Social Security Trust Fund would be paid back by the general fund. Now, we did not like that mm -hmm. because for the first time it linked Social Security and the funding stream for Social Security mm -hmm. to the general fund. Which is their objective. Well, the which, you know, Security. certainly that's why people bought off on it. So we were disappointed in that compromise, but it is supposed to snap back to 6.5% at the end of 2011. So um, it's not really related to the cap. The cap remains at $106,800, and it needs to go up. There's just no question about that. Is your organization helping people to sift through the scare politics from the, real from the reality, the social contract reality? Well, what, what we have done is we formed a very large coalition here in Washington State called Social Security Works Washington. And it's made up of some 40, 50 organizations that are working together to help educate people about what's going on with Social Security and also to put pressure on our elected representatives to make sure that they do not something that do something that is going to hurt Social Security. We've held a 75th birthday party for Social Security where over 300 people came and learned a lot about Social Security. We have an education program that we're putting together that's going to help educate people, but we're not just about education, we're about political action. If they raise their heads again and try to do something to injure Social Security, we're going to do everything we can to bop them on the head and send them back down into the hole that they deserve to be in if they're going to mess around with Social Security. Are we getting help from our senators, Murray? We and are. At this point, Senator Murray and Cantwell are being extremely helpful, as is Representative Jim McDermott. They're being very helpful. You only mentioned one representative's name. That means that other representatives are dragging their feet on uh, Social Security. I would say that that's correct. All of them are the ones that we've spoken with. Uh, at least the, the Democrats that we've spoken with said, now we're opposed to privatization. So they've all kind of staked out their anti-privatization. But on the issue of uh, raising the retirement age, uh, uh, means testing Social Security, they're a little bit shakier, and we're just going to have to uh, get them a little bit of uh, bolstering on those issues, and we intend to do it. Well, what are the polls showing about Social Security? Oh, Social Security is overwhelmingly popular. I mean, they did polling on it, and I forget what the latest polls said, but it's bipartisan. It's both Republicans and Democrats, and they are all very clear that they do not want cuts to Social Security. You know, when you asked, there was a recent poll that was done 
that suggested that uh, were people concerned about the deficit. And people expressed great concern about the deficit. But then when they were asked, well, should we do something to cut Social Security benefits to deal with the deficit, the response was overwhelming. 70, 80 percent said, absolutely not. And the reason why mm -hmm. is because people have been paying into it, and they know they've been paying into that program, and they intend to be able to reap the benefits that they paid for. If there is an effort to try and uh, you know, get rid of their obligation to pay those Treasury certificates, we got to fight. We got to fight really hard to make sure that they don't get away with it. Or we are engaged in a very serious fight to make sure that retirement age is not increased, people cannot work longer, and besides that, making people work longer means that young people will have less opportunity to enter the job market. We got to fight hard to make sure they don't do that. We got to fight hard to make sure they don't reduce benefits. And we have to fight hard to make sure that they make the kind of improvements that these times call for. This option for loophole closure as well. I do know that there are some corporations that are paying somewhere an actual tax rate of around 1.1%, 2.2%, while there are others that are paying the 35% tax rate. So we need to change the system to make sure that everyone is paying their fair share and they can't take advantage of some tax loopholes. So keep Social Security off the table and put tax loopholes. Uh, and the high, income tax uh, the high income tax cuts, we ought to get rid of them. We ought to get rid of these tax loopholes. And we ought to do something about what we're spending on the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. What about that argument that people are living longer and it was never anticipated actuarially? Well, that's, that's incorrect. The only ones who are living longer are, frankly, uh, fairly well-to-do white men. Uh, fairly well-to-do white women are at about the same uh, life expectancy as they were 10 years ago or even 15, 20 years ago. And for people of color, actually the, uh, the uh, life expectancy has declined. So it really is income-based in terms of life expectancy. So just to conclude, we can tell viewers Social Security is not broke. It's not going to break, bust the budget of the federal government. It's broke. Well, what we can say to viewers is not just that, that it's not broke. We have to say to viewers, you've got to be prepared to get engaged. You've got to be prepared to fight because there are those out there who are determined to try and use this deficit as a way to attack Social Security. And we are going to have to rise up as people, organize, and say, do not mess around with Social Security. You need to find other ways to fix your deficit problem. Do not screw around with Social Security. Robbie Stern, I want to thank you for a very enlightening discussion on Social Security. Thank you for inviting me.